what does it mean to be ultra spiritual, to have a better spirituality than others? Today, we're bringing on JP Sears to bring us lots of laughter, comedy, and deep insights. So stay until the end, because that's when we really dial up the humor with JP Sears. Welcome to Thriving Launch with Louise Congdon and Kamala Chambers, the show for heart-centered entrepreneurs who want it all. Five days a week, we bring you different segments to inspire you to live a life of freedom. We interview the leading experts in the field of business, health, and love. Be sure to check out Training Tuesdays, where we give you a clear action plan to grow your own business. Maybe you can relate to this. When I was a full-time coach, keep repeating the same things to people over and over and over again. And it got to be kind of draining and I wasn't really enjoying what I was doing anymore. So what I decided to do was record the things that I had to tell clients over and over and over again. And then I packaged those recordings together and sold them as an online course. If you're interested in creating and selling your own online course, head over to thrivinglaunch.com and I have a free training training for you on how to create and make passive income through your own online course. JP Sears, maybe you've seen him on YouTube with his comedic ultra spiritual videos with over a million subscribers on YouTube alone. JP Sears has become a hit sensation, but what a lot of people don't know about JP, he's not just a comedian, world traveler, and speaker, he's also an emotional healer with an incredible voice, an incredible contribution to today's society and culture with his videos, his work, his books. Hey, welcome to the show, JP Shears. Are you ready to launch? Uh, I think so. I've got the big red button here ready to be pushed. And I appreciate you, uh, Kamala and Louise, uh, Louise, having me on. It's a pleasure to be here with you guys. Thanks so much for being here and uh, exploring this topic about how to be spiritual without being ultra spiritual. <laughs> uh, what do you, you know, I've, I've had a lot of experience with ultra spirituality in my, my background, my practice. And uh, what does that mean to you being ultra spiritual? I, if anyone's watched your YouTube videos, they know what that means, but I'd love to hear a little bit from you. Yeah, you know, my concept behind all of the spiritual, being ultra spiritual essentially is not being spiritual. It's looking spiritual as a way of our ego building up a sense of significance at a you know an egotistical level and sometimes superiority uh, to other people. Uh, so to me, that's really what being ultra spiritual is. And when we're doing that in our life, and I do mean we, like I've spent so much time doing this and I'd like to pretend I don't still do it, but that would just be pretending. Hopefully I don't do it as much, but I think the one of the challenges for us when we're acting out our version of ultra spirituality rather than authentic spirituality is we don't know we're doing it. You know, we, we still have the adopted spiritual phraseology and we might be using a given spiritual practice and we call it a spiritual practice, not, oh, this is an ultra spiritual boost for me. I'm going to make my ego feel gratified here. Uh, so I, I think that's one of the challenges when we're ultra spiritual in our actual life. Uh, it's hard to recognize because we might actually be doing the same things that we would be doing to be authentically spiritual. It's just our why behind it, our sort of agenda behind it can be very different. Yeah, you know, I love the the way that you phrase that. It's such a important thing to look at what the motivation is behind everything we do. And I know that my background, you know, I, I studied energy medicine. I taught energy medicine for many years. I went into the coaching field and uh, was deep, deeply immersed in health coaching and that community and then went into like a whole other tantra realm. So there's there's so much that can be this masking that we have and this kind of going through the motions rather mm -hmm. than actually having an experience deep in our bodies. And I, I'm curious, what what clarifies the why for you? 
what helps you to identify what your why is? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I don't know that I ever really identify my why yet being open and curious about my why, I think is what's important to me. Um, I, I wish I could give some kind of formula for understanding with uh, an actual sense of certainty what our why is like, oh, yeah, I'm being genuine in this moment or like, yeah, you know, I'm just being delusional and egotistical in this moment. Um, <laughs> it, and I, I think maybe when we're, we feel absolute certain about something, maybe that's when we're being most delusional. I'm not totally sure. So I think having a curious attitude, uh, knowing that like, yeah, it's possible. I might just uh, be losing myself in this moment and being a pawn in my ego's chess game. And it might be possible that I'm making a genuine connection with myself in this moment. So I think the curiosity in seeing uh, both possibilities is what maybe keeps us uh, open. And I think, you know, when we see the the cliff on the edge of the mountain, we're much, in my opinion, we're much less likely to fall off the edge of the cliff that we see. And I think the edge of the cliff that we don't see, we're more likely to fall off the edge and not necessarily realize we've fallen off the edge when we do. So I do enjoy being mindful of the, you know, through curiosity of what I might call the the shadow side of spirituality, which is essentially what I call uh, ultra spirituality. And then I, I also think, you know, something that uh, maybe not a lot of us do, maybe a lot of us do, I don't really know. But uh, I think a lot of us uh, deserve to give ourselves our definition of what is spirituality to me, at least in this moment, so that I at least have a, a, a better awareness of what I'm aiming for. And I think a lot of us you know, we we know the term spirituality, and it it's used in many different abstract ways. But I think we each deserve to define, like, what does that mean to me right now, um, so that I know what I'm actually doing and aiming for, and what I'm trying to give myself through a given experience or practice. This really makes me want to ask you about what is dogma for you. What is that? I don't know. I'm just curious about that. Yeah, dogma. What that means to my delusional mind is uh, when I believe that things are the way they seem to be to me. Uh, you know, there's the you know, well, Zen, some kind of Zen saying, which says nothing is as it seems. And to me, dogma is the opposite of that. This is how it seems to me, so that's how it is. And I think when we're in a dogmatic place, we also really believe our beliefs, and we're really attached to our beliefs. And I think a non-dogmatic place is a place where we have our beliefs, but we don't believe our beliefs as much anyway. Um, I think beliefs are important. Trying to bypass them is probably just that, bypassing, not actual connection to self. Uh, so yeah, I, I think... You know, dogma, if I could have one more uh, thought about what that is, is uh, dogma is a psychological mechanism that we use to comfort ourselves. I think life is this huge mystery that we can't comprehend. And there's not much more uh, fearful to the human ego, in my opinion, than mystery, the unknown. So, and of course, when we're in a state of fear, that's uncomfortable. Some would say real life happens outside of our comfort zone. So that means we actually need the courage to be afraid to walk outside of our comfort zone. And if that's all half true, that means uh, we also develop mechanisms to comfort ourselves about this mystery of life. And dogma, why it comforts us is it erases the mystery of life. That is, it doesn't actually erase the mystery of life. I think it erases our awareness about the mystery of life because we become certain, we become rigid and righteous about our beliefs. And uh, contrary to the Buddha's wishes, we become incredibly attached to our beliefs, not because they're true, but because we feel comfortable. We feel more in control when we can believe that our beliefs are true. It gives us a sense of certainty and stability about life. 
maybe more accurately said, in my opinion, it gives us a sense of uh, the illusion of certainty and stability in life. That's really powerful for me to hear about that because I'm, as you're talking, I really reflect on parts of my life where I was very attached to some sort of belief system and how much I used it to keep me comfortable, but also how much I used it as a way for me to be able to attach myself to a group and to be able to say, this is the way and I don't need to explore or consider other paths because I'm, I'm right and they're wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't, I mean, that's a huge, huge truth that resonates for me too, uh, Luis. It's, I think one of the, what you speak to is one of the most basic and therefore most powerful human needs, which is the need to belong to a group, Uh, the need to belong a tribe to something bigger than ourself. So sometimes our beliefs we stay stuck in our beliefs because at a deeper level, our beliefs represent to us the membership card of belonging to something bigger than us. And that might be a religion. It might be our family. Like I'll keep the same family values, even if they're killing me, but at least I'll belong. I'll be uh, a member of my tribe. And, And I think that's very interesting. And to me, what your statement really brings up, it's, like going beyond like, what do you believe? It brings up a more important question. Why do you believe what you believe? And I think that's getting a little bit more to the heart of the matter. It's like, yeah, what we believe, what if that doesn't matter as much, but why we believe what we believe, maybe that has more meaning to it. I feel like this is a really good segue to go into some of the work that you do. And Kamala, go ahead and just parlay right after this question to to whatever was brought up for you. And, and maybe they'll play nicely off each other. Because as I hear this this thing about why do we believe what we believe in dogma, I'm really going into some of my own dogmas about myself uh, and, and beliefs and systems that I have that actually impinge me from being fully open to the possibilities and and some of those beliefs aren't positive beliefs you know some of us believe we're we're ugly so uh we we can't have a certain type of relationship or we're whatever it might be we we also have just our own beliefs about ourselves and it really made me curious about some of the work that you do JP with helping people bring out their voice because doing that must be like peeling back an onion and taking off layers of false beliefs that we have about ourselves. Uh, go ahead, Kamala. I hope that that kind of this kind of plays with what you were saying. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that process. Yeah, you know, helping people to help themselves peel away false beliefs. Uh, and by the way, what's a true belief and false belief? It's probably just the same thing. It's just one belief will serve us better in a given moment. It's maybe what, uh, at least I mean, with a, a truer belief. But yeah, helping people to help themselves peel back old beliefs. To me, that is synonymous with helping people make themselves more uncomfortable in their life. So it's in a way it can be a thankless job. And I think at the end of a good session with a client, the client will, part of them will be resenting themselves and me for the session. They'll resent themselves (laughs) for having signed up for this session. And then hopefully they're resenting me. And if so, that's a, that's a good sign that something was taken away. Some kind of old scar tissue of the psyche that was binding their life in some kind of constrictive way, but it was comfortable because it was familiar. If it was taken away, then there will be that resentment of I don't have as much comfort as I once did. And I think there's, there's, if we kind of boil human beings down to two simple motivations, it would be, I think we're, at least when we're in a reactive state, we're motivated by two things, avoid pain and seek pleasure. And those two really boil down to one thing, seek comfort, because of course, pleasure is comfortable and avoiding pain is comfortable. So we do that in familiar ways. And I think that really serves our self-preservation instincts well. Seek pleasure, avoid pain. Like, yeah, that's like, that's going to take that one and that's going to help you live a long life. 
maybe not a good life, maybe not a quality of life, but it'll give you more quantity of life. Like that's a principle of nature that's going to serve us all pretty well. But if we start worshiping that, then our whole life is run by this simple self-preservation mechanism that basically says the purpose of life is to be comfortable. And uh, like I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, I, I have the belief, and I'll question this belief because I'm getting pretty dogmatic with it, but I do have the belief that the quality of our life, the meaning of life is not found inside of our comfort zone. I think uh, Brene Brown, who's a wonderful author, I've never read any of her books, but I love listening to her talks. Um, actually, I've only heard two of her talks, but I've listened to them a bunch of times. Anyway. Thanks for being real about that. <laughs> I read, I actually, it was just a quote I read this one time, right? <laughs> that's, that's basically what I'm getting You're to. You're just yeah, trying just, to take away that cool factor thing where it's like, oh, wow, this guy knows Brene Brown. He's probably read all her books. And then you're like, no, I just, I read like a quote, but I read it a bunch of times. I know that. I think that's a uh, Brene Brown. She's authored 12 books. Haven't read any of them, but one quote that's somewhere in one of her books I've never read is a beautiful quote. It says something along the lines of he or she who is willing to be the most uncomfortable is not only the bravest, but rises the highest. And what rises the highest means to me, it's not some shallow sense of achievement or status. It is, uh, to me, it's about meaning. Rises the highest into a sense of meaning in their life. So, uh, but we can't do that when we're bound in the old scar tissue beliefs that are nothing but slaves to our self-preservation mechanism that says seek comfort, therefore seek pleasure, avoid pain. But when we get into a, a, a different place in life, there's something happened where we've reached a pinnacle. And this is typically where you know, a, a client I'm working with or typically people who are really into going into their heart, they've reached a place where they no longer have satisfaction just surviving life. Which yeah, We're going to have that kind of satisfaction for a few decades. But eventually, we reach a beautiful place of feeling this horrendous sense of emptiness in life. And I think that's a beautiful place because it's our savior. If we never had this uncomfortable, pervasive sense of emptiness that we just can't fill up with achievement, status, money, relationships, then we wouldn't be motivated to leave our self-preservation uh, kind of uh, master we've been serving and go towards more of a self-realization state of being. And I think self-realization, uh, sometimes it defies our self-preservation instincts, self-preservation, avoid pain. Self-realization, oh, if pain's there, embrace it. There's meaning, there's mystery. Uh, there's lessons, there's wisdom in pain, says our self-realization uh, third eye. But our self-preservation root chakra says, nope, uh, death is, uh, that's what pain will give me. It gives me potential death. So uh, anyway, uh, making a, a long story just slightly longer, that's why I think a, a good session with a client or if you read a, a book that actually speaks to your heart, then I think it's actually normal for us to resent that thing because it's our self-preservation mechanism resenting something that just took away our comfort. And then if we listen to the gratitude, our the parts of us that are geared around self-realization that are waking up like, okay, there's more to life than just surviving life. There's something about living life that I want to experience. I think self-realization is synonymous with living life. That part of us will have synonymous gratitude. So at this point, I'm, uh, I'm, I've horrendously lost sight of the beautiful question I, <laughs> I, you mentioned, but those are my thoughts about whatever was asked. Well, thank you for that. I've uh, lost sight of it, too. Thank you for that journey that you took us on. I, I'm really curious about this process that people and, you know, I can get into, most of us can get into with 
when we find something really good, right, that maybe it makes us feel really good in the moment, like you find a new superfood that it, it gives you this incredible energy in the morning, or you find that you do yoga, uh, sun salutation first thing in the morning, and it, it just changes the game for you. Then I see this process happening that people latch on to that goodness. Yeah. And then that's where the dogma can come in. It's, this is the thing. This is the miracle cure. And when I used to distribute uh, supplements, one of the things that there, that one of the doctors was talking about is that uh, if you're out in the desert and you break down and you're, you don't have any water and you drink the water from your cooling, from your, from your engine, then that is what keeps you alive. You know, like that you drink the water from your engine and that's, that's what helps you survive. Then you get back into the world and you say the miracle cure, (laughs) drink the engine water and you will like, you will actually be able to survive and walk out of the desert. So that process gets so twisted uh, and it kind of depends on where we're at and the circumstance. And just because it's right for one person doesn't mean it's right for someone else. What is your process or what do you recommend to people to kind of stop that in its tracks? You know, I, I know that I have things that I do to kind of stop that in its tracks, but I'd love to hear a little bit from you. Yeah, well, first off, uh, thank you, Kamala. I think your perspective is, I judge it to be incredibly wise. Thank you it's for probably, your judgment. Oh, you're welcome. It's probably just arrogant of me because I agree with you. It's like, oh, that's a lot of wisdom. <laughs> No, it, you have a beautiful perspective. And essentially what I heard you say is we need to remind ourselves from different angles to be present in this moment. Because what, what you alluded to, it's kind of like, okay, if a given practice, whether it's spiritual practice, nutrient practice, if it served me well 10 years ago, then if I'm still believing it serves me well without questioning it, then it means I'm stuck in the past. I, part of me is devoted to years ago instead of being present right now. So to me, what's helpful is to remind myself the reminder that the path I take to find myself can become the path that I'll lose myself on. And said another way, what what helps me can eventually hurt me. It's just like, you know, someone who's B12 uh, deficient you know, the, the foods their body will crave and that'll make them feel really good will be foods with a lot of B12 in them. And once that person's brought up to balance, like, okay, B12 is good. You don't need to uh, eat such a exaggerated amount of those foods. But if they keep eating them, they can start to go out of balance in the other direction. So I think the reminders that there's a paradox, what, the very thing that will help me can eventually hurt me. So I think that that just cause for a, a little bit of a, I would call it a recalibration in the moment to ask myself, what serves me now? This thing that served me then, like, oh, thank God, I'm so grateful for it. It, it did serve me well. And does it still serve me? And I need to have the awareness it might still serve me and it might actually be a disservice. If I can't recognize that it could be both, then I'll probably just be dogmatically stuck in the past, believing that it's helping me when it might actually not be. But if I can realize that it could be helping, could be hurting me, then I'll be able to be a little bit more objective if there ever was such a thing in um, discerning, like, is this still helpful to me or not? You know, I kind of go a little extreme with that, which maybe creates its own dogma because something that I find is that if I keep doing the same thing over and over or have these spiritual rituals or even, um, you know, try to eat the same foods that I know are the best for me, then I lose sight of why I'm doing it. And something that I do is I just, I don't, do the same thing every day. I never do the same thing. For me, routine is the the very thing that like sticks me in losing sight of curiosity, of losing sight of 
presence. And that's why I do everything I do in my life is so I have that sense of freedom so I don't have to be in, stuck in a routine, which uh, a lot of you thriving launchers, we support you in trying to break out of having to live life in a box where you have to do the same thing every single day. And, you know, I just I just wanted to hear a little bit from you about that that practice, you know, about kind of breaking out of the mundane or doing the same thing every day and continuing to question with that curiosity why we're doing what we're doing. Well, you know, yeah. before before JP answers, I talked to his assistant and she told me that he has the exact same schedule every day. He eats the same foods. There's no variation in his life. <laughs> I'm just it is kidding. a good life too. <laughs> No, I, I love you guys' perspective on routines and, you know, routines versus you know, the structure of routines versus the structurelessness of spontaneity. It's something, I mean, I love that you brought it up because it's something I pay attention to. Um, I, I will pretend that I'm in balance with it, but I will pretend that I'm I'm aiming for my balance because I found, you know, it kind of, I've spent some time I would say like I, I found some place of uh, being out of balance with being unroutine where I found like, all right, like this is it, it actually doesn't feel supportive to me. I feel like I need some kind of structure, which then allows me to go beyond the structure. But um, it's a, what some artists would call a creative constraint, like, OK, there's some routines, it's not claustrophobic. It's not um, it's cementing me in. But so for instance, my, again, not pretending I'm balanced, what I found is if I have the first roughly, what is it for me, about 45 minutes of my day is pretty structured. Uh, my system wasn't aligned about that part where I've got, you know, I, I wake up, I go for a walk, I do a gratitude practice, uh, breathing practice. And that's a structure that present day feels supportive to me. You know, uh, stay in touch with that because eventually it may not. Um, and, and then from there, there's a lot of openness to, uh, and it's weird, there's places in my schedule that are structured to allow the structurelessness of spontaneity into it. It's, a, it's like basically space on my schedule, which is, very ironic because it's like a structure to offer the structurelessness. So, but then the other thing that I've found in my life is at times I've boxed myself in and I start to feel like this five-year-old who's a prisoner, no time to play. And it's just life isn't fun because the whole darn thing is predictable. There's no surprises. And it's like, wow, that is suffocating. Um, so anyway, I, I'm, because I'm fascinated, fascinated at, uh, aiming for the, or being on the journey of trying to find my balance. I love that you brought it up and I'm curious for you guys, uh, uh, if you feel like you're in a place of balance with lack of routine or some kind of routine, I'd be curious what your secrets are in finding the balance. Yeah. Well, Luis is definitely more routine focused than I am. And and I, I never claim to be a very balanced person. Like I will, I will work intensely for five days and then take a month off. So, so I'm not the most balanced person. And for me, balance is, it's not always the most graceful process. You know, if we have to swing from one direction to the other, sometimes there's just some destruction in that swing. And, uh, well, I find that there is, uh, for me, I am a very structured thinker, you know, I'm a very focused person and, uh, it's not the routine that helps me to, to get that, you know? Uh, so someone who is not a very structured thinker, they might really need routine to get their focus. Uh, for me, it helps me to travel to various continents and and keep moving and see newness and experience different things and cultures and foods in order to 
keep that the the structure of my mind fresh i you know it's so it's not my success routine is not what other people <laughs> what would work for other people because it's always changing and so i think what the real what it really boils down to is that we find what works for us right mm-hmm. that's what it always that's exactly what you're talking about being so present in the moment with yourself and that might vary, you know, it's not like you have to achieve presence, but being able to just listen to what is needed for you moment by moment. And it may be that first 45 minutes of your day has to look the same every day. And that's what's what you need every single day. And that's beautiful. Like we all have our own, our own journey. I, I love it. Some of the wisdom that I'm definitely learning from you. First off, we're all different. And I also, I, I like how you, to me, you really alluded to what you need can be different from what you needed yesterday. So if you work five days in a row, then your needs for routine are very different where you need a lot less of it. And I think that really reminds me of an important lesson about myself that um, it's probably always been there, but I'm seeing that in a more glowing light where, you know, my schedule, it, you know, I was just traveling for about three weeks doing things that felt very purposeful, very um, important for me to commit to. So I was out doing these things. So when I'm traveling, my my schedule is, I mean, there's not breathing room in it. It's very structured. And then when I'm back from travel, I'm what I'm learning is I need to account for I need that I need to swing to the other direction it might be a dramatic swing as you mentioned to find my sense of balance where I balance where I need time where there's um just nothing scheduled so that I can find my center of gravity again or else I'll just resent whatever I'm doing uh, because I've done that too much Mm. I was going to answer that question that I yeah. was asking because you and I are so different, Kamala, where I'm already naturally, I really swing towards the lazy fair, do whatever I feel when I want, uh, things will just happen, trust in the grace of God, that kind of stuff. And and it, and it's it's very beautiful for me. And at the same time, I notice that I have a natural propensity to go too deeply towards that. And so when I was leaving high school or well, I had gotten my AA degree. So two years after graduating high school and having an AA degree, I went to my parents and I was talking to them about colleges and I had different, you know, I had a lot of variety of choices. I had very good grades and I was looking at schools and one of the schools that I was looking at was a highly regimented academic scholarly type of school, a private school, very small and then the other school was one where they don't give grades. They they write your assessments out for you. And you even create some of your own classes that are guided by the teachers. And I went to my parents and I said, you know, I, I'm struggling between choosing uh, these schools. They both appeal to a side of me, but I'm leaning towards a school that has the more academic regimented kind of thing. Because I know that if I don't have that, then I probably just won't fully take advantage of the education and I'll have a harder time accomplishing what, you know, the sixty, seventy thousand dollars that we're probably going to spend on school. Uh, And so I ended up choosing the more regimented school. And I know that with my life, for example, like showing up for the gym, I almost make it like not an option. It's just something I need to do. And, And I've learned repeatedly if I wait for too long, if I wait past like two o'clock in the afternoon, it's probably not going to happen. And and so I've learned to kind of create schedules for some things uh, and make sure that that's built in. And I even thrive within that. And and going back to this uh, creative, uh, you had the specific word, uh, uh, like creative structure. And it really reminds me of Shakespeare. Shakespeare was someone that worked in one of the heaviest structured arts uh, to, to write poetry that had all these different rules and to write stories within all these rules and language and rhymes and rhyme schemes and language patterns. I studied English literature, very, very regimented thing. And yet some of the most beautiful pieces of art have come from that. So for me, it's funny because my natural propensity as a human is just to be very laissez fair. And yet I know that I need structure. Otherwise, I won't get a lot done. 
It's mm. it's like you think in spirals and I think in bullet points <laughs> and you need more structure and I need less, <laughs> which is very interesting. It's like how you have to find what works for for your mind and you think that I would need more structure or you know, I'd like a really structured life because of right. the way I think. Well, you and I really uh, support each other too yeah. and also create yeah. frustrations for each other because I come with these spirals and you're going, okay, give me the bullet points. And I'm like, I don't know <laughs> bullet points. That's why I'm trying to give this to you because I have this dream and this vision. And, and then she gets a headache sometimes like, God, he just came to me with like 10 different dreams. Now I have a hundred bullet points in my head and now I have to like <laughs> lay them out for him so he understands what to do. But it's, it's, very, it's very beautiful and very chaotic sometimes. Uh, I want to take some, unless you had something you wanted to say, JP, uh, I wanted to just go through a couple of questions from our audience. Yeah, I'd love to okay. uh, do a little dance with those. Yeah. So the first question is, where do you get all of your fashionable headbands? You know, uh, that's a great question. Probably the most important question I'm, anybody could ask. So all of my fashionable fashionable headbands, I really only have three. The main one that I use, I stole it from my ex-girlfriend. And by stole, I mean I was basically given uh, give, given it by given. It was given to me by her if I was pretending like I know how to speak proper English. Uh, so right before we filmed the first ultra spiritual video back October 2014, the she was behind the camera and you know I, we, I just about ready to go and I'm like wait I sh- kind of this ultra spiritual video you knew uh, I should wear a headband and I asked her do you have anything I could use for a headband so she brought this scarf out and tied it around my head and we stuck a flower in it and. Uh, yeah, so that's where I got the main headband I use. Uh, it used to be a scarf of my ex-girlfriend. Well, this is great. And I love these lightning round questions. We got a couple more for you. Um, is it difficult for you to be more spiritual than everyone else around you? It is. It feels lonely. And at the same time, you can't spell lonely without onely. So I think it... <laughs> simultaneously helps connect me to more oneness by being uh, more spiritual slash better than everybody else. (laughs) People are asking, do you only drink superfoods and are you also a sun gazer? I don't drink superfoods for this reason because I'm so non-toxic. Superfoods are actually a toxin to me. So I I don't want to touch the things. Uh, And then sun gazing, no, I don't do that. I like to do mirror gazing. Mirror gazing. Wow. God, I got to put that in my list of routines to <laughs> implement. Yeah, the, the mirror looks way more handsome than the sun does. Mm. One question I have, at what point did you become enlightened? It was, it's hard to remember, but it was six or seven lifetimes ago. Um Yeah. And I was sitting under a tree. I was feeding a stray cat and I looked deep into the cat's eyes. And in that moment, I just had an instant knowing of everything. Uh, I even knew about the unknown. And I had a knowing that the unknown isn't so unknown anymore. (sighs) Wow. You can't even ask the question, can you, Luis? Like you're. I'm I'm struggling. I mean, how do I ask him anything now? Because he knows. And I know that you don't know, so I'm happy to give you the answer. So another question here we have from an audience, a listener, is, is it hard to leave your house with so many people knowing who you are nowadays? Uh, That's a good question. And uh, uh, the serious part of me, um, I don't like that word. I feel like serious about how I don't like the word serious. But anyway, the sincere part of me, uh, I guess, jumps on that ship. And uh, sometimes it actually uh, is, depending on, um, you know, where I'm going, what I'm doing. Um, But uh, I I am very, it's very, uh, hard is not the right term, but I'm very fortunate that Uh, There's a lot of people that watch my videos and I feel so grateful when people want to come up and they recognize me and want to say, hey, maybe take a picture. Like I love doing that. And then there's also sometimes where 
I need to be introverted. And, uh, and then, you know, having a lot of external interactions and conversations with random people, it is absolutely beautiful on one hand. And then like in another dimension, it can take my attention away from myself. Uh, so, you know, with that, it's, it's kind of our, one of our themes of this conversation being balance. Uh, it just means I have to learn. I'm in the process of learning a new balance of like, well, I've got to meet my introverted needs um, elsewhere sometimes. So that might just mean sometimes I lock myself in my dark garage and don't leave for three weeks. Cool. Yeah. And watch I Ty Lopez too. videos. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel so inspired by it. <laughs> well, you know, there's a lot of people writing in hoping that you're going to start your own religion. Mm. What's uh, have you filed the papers to do that? What's your process? Uh, the only thing I feel religious about is being unreligious. Uh, so for me, it's my religion is devoted to not being religious at all, which is basically atheism, except my religion is significantly more spiritual than atheism. Um, it's ultra spirituality. So by definition, it can't be a religion, which is really, really uh, liberating. And it's also terrible in the sense that uh, there's no tax breaks. Oh, shoot. Well, thank you so much for enlightening us all today and for showing up both as you and also you, the other side of you. I'm going to go schedule my meditation now. <laughs> Good. And if, okay. uh, make sure to announce that over social media. <laughs> well, let's get a picture of you doing it. Like that's, you know, you have to get your get you in full lotus, Luis. We're going to have to get so, a JP. I'm going to need you to mail me one of those uh headbands. I I would be honored. I'll go raid my ex-girlfriend's closet next time I get a chance to see her. <laughs> Was it the scarf that broke you guys up? Was that really the nail in the coffin? You know, she didn't say that it was about the scarf. But I think it was about the scarf <laughs> because she she just I mean, to me, it was painfully obvious. She had this deep sense of jealousy about how much I valued the scarf. Mm. Yeah, I'm like that with Louise's dog. <laughs> <laughs> she was like that with my dog as well. Yeah. So, yeah. It's hard to compete with that, love. But uh, hey, man, thanks so much for being Thank on the show. Thank you so show. much, JP. We've been here with JP Sears. You've been listening to Thriving Launch. And you guys keep thriving, keep laughing, keep your hearts light. You've been listening to the Thriving Launch Podcast. For books and resources related to today's episode, make sure to head over to thrivinglaunch.com. We'll see you there. In the next episode, we are going to sit down and chat about how to make passive income. This is going to be part four. We're going to talk about automation.